relaxing even more. As you begin now to breathe in life, the divine presence, prana, chi, whatever words you use, know that you are infusing the cells of the body with light, with new energy, that it is awakening the wisdom in the body, the divine intelligence that created the body, knows exactly how to run it perfectly at an optimum level. As you do this, your body has no age at all. It is not at the effect of genetics or DNA, except the DNA and genetics of God. One perfect life, one perfect being, and you are that. You rest in that with that and everything unlike that simply dissolves. There's nothing to fix or change or get rid of. There is just this ever-expanding inner peace. As you let yourself be Just for now, let yourself be. Let the mind relax into its natural state of spaciousness. No limits, no walls. safety and the warmth of this divine presence, you know now that it's safe to let go of everything you brought in here with you that no longer serves you, whether it is some own limiting belief, a worry, a regret, some condition or attachment or behavior. you come here this morning to surrender to spirit. We're going to let that all go with the exhale, so take a nice deep breath and breathe it all out. it all to that stream of light as it dissolves and dissipates into nothing so that you feel more buoyant and free letting your consciousness rise up 
above the body just for now to the upper room the secret place of the most high into the Christ mind the Buddha heart the arms of the Divine Mother entering now with empty hands and an open heart not here to get anything but in this moment the only purpose is to tabernacle with your God all the thoughts begin to fade into the background go just for now of the idea that you want or need anything. And for the next minutes, in the quietness, rest in God. for this divine presence, the source of all life, God, the mother, father, whatever words or images or feelings are right for you, give thanks to it now. As you think about and feel gratitude, all the blessings in your life, what are you thankful for this morning? Be sure to call to mind at least three things that you can be grateful to yourself for, three things that you can honor about you. stretch your consciousness to be grateful for future blessings that which is still in the invisible but even now moving towards manifestation as we give thanks for our collective good the chair we sit in the beings around us this time and space to gather the freedom that we have in this country to gather like this and believe or not believe whatever we choose. The vision, the staff, the volunteers, the wonderful sacred teachings and teachers that we study, the paved roads that got us here, water to bathe in and drink and plentiful food so easily available. So many things that we take for granted we stop now to give thanks for, to feel appreciation for. And begin now from this state of gratitude to activate joy as you think about what makes your heart sing. What do you love to do or see or feel or hear or taste brings you joy. Think 
of something in the past few days or week that brought you joy. Find a moment of joy. Try to feel that joy again. Isn't it wonderful to feel the joy? From this joyful place, we move into our intentions, beginning first with how do you want to feel when you leave here today? Imagine yourself getting up at the end and walking out. Decide now how you want to feel. And decide how you want to feel the rest of this weekend or week. No matter what does or doesn't happen, how do you want to feel? And now we move into our prayers, what we open to receive from the divine presence within, not to get from something or some mythical being outside of us, but from the one true God that exists in the kingdom within. What do you open to receive? might go even deeper to see what is your soul's deepest intention in being here today. And we fold all of these into our group intention, which is as always, the healing of our minds, our restoration to joy, to sanity, to inner peace. We recognize that we have been drawn together this morning by the power and in the presence of God. And it is to God that we devote our time spent together as well as our relationships to one another, knowing that the Holy Spirit within us will so guide us in our thoughts and in our feelings and in our perceptions of all things that we may go to sleep tonight as happier, more peaceful, and more loving beings. For this we are thankful, and together we all say, Amen. <laughs> Welcome. So good to see you. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been five weeks. Feels like a long, long time. So let's just get busy here. Let's get going. I am your deep programmer for the day. That's not really what I'm doing all the time. I just go around and talk to myself, and other people uh, seem to like to listen in. And mainly what I'm doing is deprogramming. It's a major deprogramming system. It's interesting that we are, from the time that we're born, uh, the culture and the family that we're born into is beginning to teach us things. And so certainly those first few years, we're taught some very important things as far as how to communicate and how things are done within our culture and within our family. And then we go off to school and most of what we learn is horseshit. And so, <laughs> and not all that helpful either. And so the one thing it seems that we are not taught and what New Thought is about, so certainly here at the, I, I still think of these as religious science churches, they're now called spiritual centers, but certainly the root of religious science and all of these uh, basic new thought organizations and churches is to do the most important thing and the thing that we are not really taught is hopefully what you're learning here, which is how to think, how to use your mind. And that's the thing that we're not taught is how to use our mind. And we are basically brainwashed from the time we're born by the culture that we're in into certain worldviews. And some of those worldviews are helpful and some of them are not helpful. And so uh, 
one of the things that A Course in Miracles says, it says miracles don't do anything, miracles undo. And a lot of what we do in New Thought is not so much learn as unlearn. And so a lot of our process is more of an undoing than a doing. New Thought itself, metaphysics itself, can be described in a pamphlet. That's how complicated it is. You can get it in a pamphlet. So it isn't that, oh, it's complex and it's hard and it's difficult to understand and grasp. It couldn't be more simple. It's just that it's what I call opposite world because it's the extreme opposite of everything that you will learn out there. So it makes it seem difficult because it takes a lot of diligence. And that's the part that we don't like. A Course in Miracles says, you are much too tolerant of mind wandering and are passively condoning your mind's miscreations. Try to say that again. You are much too tolerant of mind wandering and are passively condoning your mind's miscreations. So, A Course in Miracles and all of this stuff is really about an undoing and also a retraining of the mind. You train your mind to think differently. And so, and I've been, I'm trying to shift this. I've been very critical of a lot of, I consider myself post-spiritual. So I was raised religious and I was raised in the Catholic Church and I tried on a bunch of religions and I was religious and then I went from religion to spirituality and I was in spirituality for many years and I found out that spirituality was just religion in tie-dye. <laughs> so then I thought, okay, I'm post-spiritual. <laughs> Free of those boxes entirely. And so the modern kind of metaphysical movement is a mishmash of a lot of things that all contradict each other. Thank you, Oprah. <laughs> I mean, she mainstreamed a lot of this stuff, but it's all very confusing, and it's a lot of stuff that's simply not true. And I always say uh, in my classes, just because something sounds really spiritual and sweet doesn't mean it isn't horseshit that will kill you. And so we have to, just because somebody, it doesn't matter who said it, you have to look and see, how is that really true? I need to think about this. Well, I say this all the time, but it's, it's a very popular one that Maya Angelou said this to Oprah, so now Oprah says it all the time, so people just believe it, even though it's one of the biggest bags of horseshit that you could possibly ever hear. Is, and Oprah says this all the time, when you know better, you do better. The entire history of humankind speaks to the contrary. In fact, oftentimes the extreme opposite of that is true, is once you know better, then you do worse. Have you ever noticed that? If, if it were true that when you know better, you do better, everyone in the world who'd ever gone on a diet would have only ever been on one. Because then you would have known, oh, I donuts are not diet food. So you'd know, right? But sometimes it's after you know better that you've gained all the weight, right? So it can't be true that when you know better, you do better. So, but sometimes we accept these quasi-spiritual things and we say them. They're just platitudes that we say to people to make them feel better. So, oh, we don't want you to feel bad. We say, well, you didn't know better. Now you know better, you'll do better. And then you watch them go off the cliff. Right? So we have to stop and question these things and say, is this really helpful? Because all of these things that we're taught, then when we have a thought system that becomes then a belief system, it becomes a paradigm. And so I watched in my journey, that spiritual journey of all of the teachers that uh, I kind of studied, a lot of their various books and things that were applicable and helpful for where I was at the time based on the paradigm that I was living in at the time. Now, one of the fundamentals of new thought that also is misleading is this whole thing that change your thinking, change your life. Because that's really not quite it, that's partially it. One of the things that people sometimes think, particularly in the beginning, is they'll use affirmations and then they'll say, oh, affirmations don't work. Well, it's true that an affirmation cannot work in a thought system that opposes it. What do I mean by that? I mean that 
It's not change your thinking, change your life. It's change your paradigm, change your life. If you are just putting a new thought into an old thought system, that's what Jesus meant when he said you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. You can't have an old paradigm that life is difficult and life sucks and then just have a affirmation of everything's going my way <laughs> think that that's going to work. It's not going to work. So, at a certain, so I had this experience that many people have where for years and years and years I was reading and studying, I was teaching this stuff and very unhappy. But I had made peace with misery. And a lot of spiritual people do that. And that's why tomorrow, this morning's talk is really about enjoying the journey. Enjoying the journey. I am, new thought in a lot of ways, is very goal-oriented. It's very important that we have goals. It's very important that we have objectives that we want to meet. But the goal and the attainment of it will never make you happy. It's important to understand that those are two different things. Happy. See, we're taught that happiness comes from achievement and meeting your goals, but we have a, a whole culture full of people who are meeting their goals all the time and are not any happier. So then what spirituality did with that was said, oh, well, that's the problem. Goals are bad. Just go for peace. So then what you have are a lot of peaceful, unhappy people <laughs> because they've made peace with their unhappiness. Now, I want you to think about this because this is very insidious, and it, it just infiltrates most of the best-selling new thought authors are teaching peace in misery. A lot of those Oprah, and Oprah loves darkness and depression. Don't kid yourself. Look at her book club. There's never a happy book in that book club. She wants to hear about someone who was murdered, raped, something horrible is an Oprah book club pick. So, and I, this is nothing against Oprah. It is that she represents a lot of what the whole country believes to be true, which is that life sucks. Okay, and that's a paradigm, right? This is, and this is a misunderstanding too. This is the bastardization. We bring, we bring these other religions from other places and then we fuck with them. So we brought Buddhism here and then we corrupted it. And see, what the Buddha said was, life is dissatisfactory because you want something permanent from the impermanent world. So what Americans did with that, they said, Buddha said life is suffering. Okay, that's not what, that's not it. <laughs> that's not it at all. He said, you are dissatisfied with life because you're trying to create something permanent in the impermanent world, right? You don't want to get old. You don't want to be sick. You don't want to see things change. You don't want to ever be poor. You don't want to, all those things. You put all your happiness out here, and that's why you're dissatisfied with life, and that's why you're not enjoying your journey and enjoying your moment. That you enjoy your journey and you enjoy your moment, not by ignoring the world out there, not by not having goals, not by not participating, but by not getting attached to the world of appearances because they're always going to be changing. So you're meant to enjoy the journey, whether you're high or low on the scale of I have a lot, I don't have a lot. You know, in, this, in the scriptures where it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, that's another one we fucked up. Because we just plucked that out and we didn't take the part before it which is the most important part. Because Paul didn't just say, because we use that then as motivation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it just becomes another motivational quote. Successories. The part before it where Paul says that I can go through anything. I've been poor and I've been rich and I've been in jail and I've been free and I've been loved and I've been hated. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So what's he saying? Those things don't affect my joy. I don't let them steal my joy. I can go through anything and still I can do it all through Christ which strengthens me. Christ being a consciousness. Through the Christ consciousness and awareness, it doesn't matter if I have a lot or have a little. It doesn't matter if I'm sick or if I'm well. I can still choose my consciousness. I can choose my joy. I can enjoy the journey. 
So there were lots of people that I read along the way that once I started being devoted to being happy, because I found out, guess what? Lean in. <laughs> you cannot teach joy if you're miserable. <laughs> now, I know people who try, but you can't. A Course in Miracles says to teach is to demonstrate. So when I realized, if I'm going to teach joy, I have to be joyful. Here's another big secret. You will not find joy by studying depression. <laughs> People think this. They read spiritual books about depression, and then they feel, oh, that really spoke to me. Well, then you're fucked. Because <laughs> that shouldn't. That's not good. You are aligning yourself with something that you do not want to be true. You need to shift your paradigm. I call this a secret society of joy. It is a secret society of joy. There are just some people you have to go like go undercover, like the French resistance. You're like, are you? Yeah, I'm a licensed joyologist. <laughs> Keep it under your hat. Because you don't want people to know you're happy because we live in a culture that says life is hard, it should be hard, make sure everybody knows that you're having a hard time. That's how you have camaraderie with other people. I used to read Anne Lamott, and then I woke up. You know Anne Lamott? Anne Lamott, who writes these, again, I, I saw her just recently on, it was from a couple of years ago, but I just saw it recently, where she was speaking at this writer's conference thing, and she was talking, about, and it was about writing, and the whole thing was, as I hear her now, and I see, dear God, I mean, I just wanted to say, Anne, you're not Viktor Frankl. You're not writing Man's Search for Meaning. You are not in a Nazi concentration camp. But she talks about life like life is a Nazi concentration camp. I'm like, you're a white woman living in Northern California that writes best-selling books. How fucking bad is it, Anne? But she talks like she, I mean, the whole, the whole tenor of everything that she said was how fucking hard everything is. Life, she said, life for humans is just an endless heartbreak. It is just an endless heartbreak. It is all just heartbreaking. And then talking about writing, she just, all she could talk about was, it's just the hardest thing and it's so hard and every day to sit down on the page is hard and you have to make yourself because you will feel good later because you did the hard thing. And I was like, oh, honey. Your paradigm sucks ass. <laughs> like within this belief system, it's like no matter what happens, it's suffering. There you are, you've written, oh, but you're, you doubt your voice all the time and you doubt if it's good and you doubt this and you doubt that. All you have to do is change your story. That's your paradigm. Your paradigm is the story you're telling about the world and your life and the way things are and how you're looking at things. But it, that's the part about it that does seem to be difficult because it takes so much inner discipline to keep coming back to what all that we did in the beginning. That's what I do. I do almost verbatim the same meditation at every single lecture because it is part of the mind training, which, and that's all we did at the beginning. Was well, we just went through and said, isn't it good? That's what we did. We methodically went through and said, isn't it great that we have this room? Isn't it wonderful that vision is here? Isn't it wonderful that we had paved roads that got us here? Isn't it wonderful that we had water to bathe in and drink? Isn't it great that you had enough food in your house to eat today? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it great that we live in a country where we can say things like this and there's nobody meeting you at the door saying, what are you gonna talk about? What political party are you in? What are you agreeing to? We can just come in here and say any old thing we want, more or less, right? I can't scream fire, but you know, Within reason, there's nobody questioning whether you belong here or not. So you start to, oh, isn't that great? Isn't that great? And then think about what do you have to be grateful for? What do you love in life? What brings you joy? What happened in the last week that brought you joy? Just some moment, maybe it was just your dog still seems to like you. <laughs> like after all you've done, just still seems to be thrilled with you like it's the first time every day. The cat, not so much, but the dog. <laughs> Right. just never holds anything against you. So sometimes that can just be, oh, that moment of joy. And joy is not 
this giddy thing all the time, that joy can be the thing that made you cry. You know, sad things, all, I don't think I've cried about something sad in many, 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 many years. I cry all the time about love. That is the easiest way to make me cry. Some stupid Christmas commercial where some veteran comes home or, you know, that kind of shit. So that's joy to me. But, you know, I might be crying, but that's a joyful experience to me. I always talk about my friend David Kessler, who is like the prince of death. He's the, <laughs> the king of grieving. You know, if, you, if any celebrity dies, turn on E.T. and there will be David Kessler. Because he writes for Hay House, and he's written with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross before she passed, and he's all about grief and dying. And I worked for him back in the 80s uh, as a staffing person. He had one of the very first uh, HIV and AIDS home uh, nursing things. And so he was a, a registered nurse who started his own company that was really, because at that time, people would not touch people with AIDS. And so it was very difficult to even find nurses who would go into people's homes and care for them because these people didn't want to be in the hospitals because in the hospitals they'd come in in hazmat suits. Like that's how it was then. So he was very familiar with the process of death and dying and all this stuff. And so he's around it all the time. But that's his joy. But obviously it's not a giddy kind of joy. So when I'm talking about joy, I'm not talking about, oh, fiddle dee dee, Scarlet, I'll think about it tomorrow. Right? We're not talking about the suppression of things and pretending. And it's, this is not the pink icing on a shit cake. <laughs> this is not what we're doing. Right? We, are actually, we actually see that, yes, it's true. But this is the bastardization of this stuff, too, that makes it so horrifying with people like Anne Lamott. Who, and I know that she doesn't even know what she's doing. These people don't even know what they're doing, is that they are taking a really good life and shitting on it every day because they're so focused on, yes, I'm not suffering right now, but I'm thinking about somebody in India. Right? I'm, I'm thinking about the disturbing da-da-da-da-da. So there's always some reason why I can't really fully be in joy right now is because somebody somewhere is suffering. You know, one of the, one of the, great guest that was on Oprah was that little boy, Matty Stepanek, who I can't even remember what illness he had. He's passed away now, but his whole family had it. His mother had it, and they were on for several years, and he would write these little poet, poems that they then turned into books. And it would take them, I remember them talking about how long it took them to start the day, because they were all in wheelchairs and all this stuff. And so it would be hours in the morning just to get up and be washed and ready for the day. And so he had a lot of physical pain and misery and was filled with joy and was only suffering when he was actually suffering. See, that's what I want you to start to think about is how much we suffer when we're not suffering. But because we're thinking about suffering, we suffer. And so one of the things that he said that I never forgot was he said, you have to remember to play after every storm. And Anne Lamott is somebody who, from my experience of everything that I read of her and that she says, is most of the time either in a storm or worried about the next storm. Or is thinking about a storm somebody else is having somewhere else. But the sunshine of her day is just a moment of grace. She calls it all grace because grace is only just a momentary thing, right? Because you can't get too used to being feeling good. Don't get comfortable in feeling good. The other shoe might drop. Right? We have to start to think about these things, these, these little colloquialisms that we expect, that we accept as like, oh, the other shoe might drop. So I say, yes, it's probably Prada. <laughs> right? What you want to do, that's a paradigm shift. As we stop being Debbie Downer, good Lord, I mean, that's opposite world. Is it takes a tremendous discipline and willingness to be happy. You know, um, what's his name? Penn Jillette. I don't know if you know Penn Jillette from Penn and Teller, who's just written this book about how he lost 105 pounds. And again, this is so American. <laughs> this is such an American thing. He said, because he was a very ill health, and the doctors were saying, you know, you probably need to, because it was, 
I can't even remember, he said how many different blood pressure medications he was on, and he said it was so sky high, they just couldn't get it down. It was just almost impossible with, at least, he was on at least eight different blood pressure medications, and they were trying to get his blood pressure down, and so they basically said, you need to have the gastric bypass, and he said, let me try it myself. So he ended up losing under five pounds, but he said, I love this because it was so, just the fucked up mind. He said, well, you know, everybody said, says how easy it is and, you know, just portion control and da -da. And he said, that's why I couldn't do it. He said, because I don't want to do anything easy. It had to be hard. It had to be hard. He said, nobody respects anything. And, and he's serious about this. He's not speaking like I am from the ironic, isn't that fucked up? He was like, no, this is the American way. He said, we only respect people who do hard things. He said, I do magic because it's hard. I do this magic show because it's hard. And nobody knows how you do it. And we like to be challenged endlessly. He said, so it had to be hard for me to lose the weight. So he said, all I, he said, I just turned entirely to, and he said, it's great because he says in the book, don't do this. He says, I am not, he says, if you are taking medical advice from a magician, you're an idiot. He said, you have to see your doctor. He said, don't do what I did. I'm just saying this is what I did because I'm insane and it had to be hard. So he went entirely to plant-based eating entirely. So no, no portion control, no enjoyment of anything that he used to like. He went entirely to plant-based food. And I saw him on Dr. Oz. He was eating like this huge, it was like this enormous bowl of just blueberries with, I think he had cayenne pepper on them and something else, and that was it. That's all he ate the entire day. He said, I only eat one meal a day, I'm not, and that's all I eat, and da 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 And he said, it, of course, that's pretty fucking hard, right? I just eat blueberries. <laughs> one meal a day, then I'm out. That sounds pretty hard, okay, <laughs> to go from, you know, I eat a lot of red meat and I eat all this stuff, now I'm just having whatever, just like bananas like just some weird shit like that. But that was hard. But that's the ethos of the culture, which is if it's hard, it's better. If you're struggling and suffering and it's hard, it's better. And my whole thing is, why? Why? What's so great about things being hard? What? I don't really need a statue built to me, do you? Because if you're going to get a statue, it means you had a horrible life. That's how you get a statue. Someone assassinated you. You died on a hill in a war, so your statue has a sword through you. You're a bleeding saint. So if you really want a statue, please continue suffering. Statue on the way, maybe. But if you don't care about a statue, then I would just say, go ahead and have a good life. Everybody's going to forget you in about 10 minutes after you're gone anyhow. Sorry if that upsets you. But I mean, that's an exaggeration. If you have children, then, you know. Of course, the way people are now, people are having children so late in life, that's really all that will remember you because you won't live to see your grandchildren. You know, when you're 70 and you're having your first baby, you're really just going to only know the kid. So don't think multi-generational memories of you. It's just going to be, you know, probably a few people. So if you're not having fun, what's the point? Because here's the other thing. This is another big lie that we fall into, which is that lessons suck. Right? Isn't that just a given? That if you, oh, I'm a spiritual person, I'm learning a lesson. What you mean is, I'm in hell. Well, of course, a miracle says it's not up to you what you learn, just whether you learn through joy or through pain. So it's saying your lessons can be joyful if you're willing. This, this is the benefit of the actual, real Viktor Frankl, is saying that in a Nazi concentration camp, he was able to maintain his discipline of the mind. He said, well, they could do anything they wanted to my body but they could not control my mind if I did not give them control of it. So I refused to see myself as an animal even though they treated me like an animal and called me an animal. 
That's discipline. Do you know what he did? This is so new thought. This is why, you know, when people, I'm sure, you know, make fun of my, all my Neville stuff. I love Neville, Neville Goddard. But you know what Viktor Frankl did while they were torturing his body? He would visualize himself in his classroom describing to his students how he had lived through being in a Nazi concentration camp. If that's not visualization 101A under duress, right? And you and I, it's hard. Right? Oh, it's so hard. It's just so hard to visualize. It's so hard. Oh, Jacob, it's hard. Nobody's torturing you, but it's hard. It's really hard. Right? I've started, uh, just since I moved back to Los Angeles, I set up a little space in my apartment to do private sessions with people that I, they're like, I'm so old school. I'm the oldest old school there is. So this is like old school practicing. This is not what a lot of people do now, which is like counseling and stories and da da da. This, whoever comes to see me gets minimal talking. It's not about come in and tell your story. Minimal talking. So they come in and I do an opening meditation that's sort of like what I do here. Same kind of, we play Bethany, the whole thing to sort of get them. Because if you set somebody down and just get them talking, they're just talking from the mind that's So you've got to get that out of the way first. So we do that, we get that out of the way first. Then I just say, just very briefly, what's the issue? You know, there's a, have you ever seen the man who came to dinner? Two people. So, <laughs> the man who came to dinner is fabulous Christmas movie with Betty Davis and a whole bunch of other people that takes place. Anyhow, this guy who is, uh, and it's based on actual real people. It's based on this radio uh, guy. Um, so sort of famous characters within it. And he is uh, a traveling lecturer who has this radio show. And he's, and he's just a horrible, horrible person. And Betty Davis is his personal secretary. And they're traveling through this town to give a lecture. And he falls on the steps of the house of these rich people in town. And so he ends up having to stay with them over Christmas. And he just destroys their lives. Living with, takes over their house and just destroys their lives over Christmas, just being horrible. And then one of his celebrity friends comes to visit, who is basically Noel Coward. The, they're playing basically Noel Coward. And so when he comes in, and I, I wanted just to give this one fabulous line to you and for you to just hold this in your heart till the day you die. He, the preamble to him asking how this guy is, is uh, I'm trying to remember what the lead character's name is. It's, um, I can't remember. But instead of just asking him how he is because he's in this wheelchair and he's hurt his leg and he's a big fucking baby, he says, without going into mountains of self-pity. <laughs> no, he goes, without going into mountainous waves of self-pity, how are you? <laughs> so I want you to just think of that forever. <laughs> without going into mountainous waves of self-pity, how are you? Because that's the story that we amplify, the mountainous waves of self-pity. So. To begin, okay, let me see what else I want to tell you. I'm just so happy to be here. I'm gonna pinch myself. Oh. So, somebody told me something just the other day. It was so fabulous because it was so everything that we do that it, it sort of tied in with what I've started doing with people as I'm doing these private sessions with them, which is, they tell me what the issue is, and then I do a treatment for them based on that. Then after they leave, I record a treatment for them on MP3 that I can either turn into a CD or an MP3 for them to listen to for 30 days. So that it's not, they just don't just have the session of what I said and try to remember that or whatever. And it depends on what we've talked about, whether for some, what I've noticed, because now that I'm doing this regularly, is how many people have trouble at night with sleeping. So some of, for some of the people, what I'm doing are treatments that they're listening to as they go to sleep. 
Because people, because this is what happens is, if you have trained yourself to believe that life is supposed to be hard and you're torturing yourself all day long, then you just continue that into the nighttime unless you stop. So part of the treatment is like getting them to stop that and all the issues that people have around what they're thinking as they're going to sleep. So this, this friend of mine was saying to me the other day, was talking about, he said, about these nightmares, these horrible, violent nightmares that he has, that he's had forever, like all his life. And he said, it was like, in a sense, it was like out of the mouths of babes. And so he said, uh, oh, I've had them all my life, and there is this off. And, and he said, I, for a while, I recorded them, and I would write them down to see if I, you know. And he said, this was the line. This was so perfect. He said, I've noticed that when I pay more attention to them, they get worse. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. Because what we're hearing in this culture all the time now, more and more and more, is how depressed everyone is. That depression has become like a virus moving through the country. Why is that? Because of how much attention is being given to it. Because of how much we're studying it. Because the more you study depression, the more you activate depression. The more you study illness, the more virulent the illnesses become. Whatever you are studying, you are activating. I want you to start thinking about that. What I'm studying, I'm activating. So we're now ready, I believe, this underground, this growing underground of people are interested now in studying joy. Because the only way we will ever create joy is by studying joy joy, not by studying depression or what makes people depressed. Finding out why people are getting depressed will never heal depression. It's like saying, I think if I go into this dark room and really investigate the darkness, then there will be light. Um, what? <laughs> As we study illness, have you ever, this is a phenomenon where there are doctors who will spend their whole life studying a disease and then get exactly the disease they studied. Hmm, how did this happen? Because whatever you become a vibrational match to, right, you are aligning yourself with, right? This is the difference sort of between old school psycho psychotherapy and new school psychotherapy. I was talking about the woman, Michelle Weiner, who wrote, I would really have changed that name, seriously. <laughs> but anyhow, she's a therapist, Michelle Weiner. And uh, she wrote this book that was originally called Fire Your Shrink. But apparently, that didn't go over so well. Because when I first bought it, that's what it was called. And then later, when they redid it, it was called, it was like they learned some marketing, right? So then the new title, and it's out of print now, but the new title of it is How to Change Your Life and Everyone in It. People love that, right? You mean I can change the other people in my life? <laughs> Finally, the book I've been looking for my whole life. So How to Change Your Life and Everyone in It. And she does what she calls brief therapy. The idea being that you would not see her for any more than five sessions. That the ideal was three to five sessions and you'd be done. Because you don't talk about your past. You don't go in and sit down in the chair and start talking about, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Because, and this is, what, this is how consciousness works. And again, this is opposite to everything that you'll be told out in the world. Every time you talk about some wound from the past, you've reactivated it. And it now is a cause that you have to be at the effect of. You can't have a cause without an effect. Did you know that? So if you sit down and you say, in my past, this cause, then you will in that moment be at the effect of it. Everything you talk about becomes a cause in your life that you are now the effect of. So the idea was, you don't talk about your past, you talk about basically what's the issue now and how do we solve it? 
But here's what she says. This is the question she asks as they sit down in the chair. The first question she asks them is, how will we know when we can stop meeting like this? Now, what has she done in that moment? She has forced them to shift out of, oh, I was going to tell you how horrible and fucked up everything is. Now, she has propelled them into a future moment when the problem is gone and is making them describe it. Because she's saying, how will we know when we can stop meeting like this? So they're saying things like, I'll be sleeping through the night again. I'll be going to the gym again. I'll be going to my dance classes again. I will be wearing my regular clothes instead of my depressed clothes. You know you have depressed clothes. Don't act like you don't. That's why they made sweats. <laughs> sweats tell the world, I've given up. Okay? They're not comfortable. They've told the world, I've given up. So you'll know, oh, I start wearing colors again and things that make me feel good. All of these things, right? That she's propelled them into it. She is not now saying, I'm going to tell you. It. She's making them start to describe their lives when their lives work. Now, that's the new cause. They are making their own present cause themselves. So they're starting to imagine, here's what I'll be doing, this is what I'll be wearing, this is where I'll be going, this is what I'll be eating, this is what I'll be thinking, right? All of that becomes the new cause. It is not saying, I hope I'll feel joyful, I hope I'll feel better. It's saying, oh, I'm going to activate my joy right now by the story I tell. I'm not going to wait for things to get better. I'm going to start telling the story now. If I start telling the story now, what that does with consciousness is that begins to shift your paradigm. Right? This is why I'm going to say everything I say today is probably horrifying. You should run. <laughs> run for your life. <laughs> this is why venting doesn't work. You should stop immediately. Boy, people love to vent. Let me just vent for a minute. Because people, here's the thing, is venting makes you feel better. It doesn't make you feel good. And you need to know there's a difference. Vomiting makes you feel better. It doesn't make you feel good. <laughs> venting and vomiting, I want you to start to align those two things. <laughs> they are the same thing. They're literally the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. You vomit because there's something in your system that's disturbing the system, that's not natural to the system, that needs to be expelled. When it's expelled, what you feel is relief. You don't feel good. You feel relief. You were being tormented by this thing. Now you feel relief because you're not being tormented by this thing anymore. You don't feel good. Now, what we're going for is to feel good and really to feel peace. The mind needs to understand peace and relief are very different things. A lot of people accept relief instead of peace. So venting is the same thing. You have a lot of toxic thoughts going on that are creating horrible feelings. Right? Somebody rejected you, you got a bad, you were in an argument with somebody, you, somebody betrayed you, you did all this stuff that you want to vent about. You want to vent about somebody who said something, who did something, who went, so you, I need to vent about this. Right? So what you're saying is, I don't feel at peace anymore. I feel tormented inside. I need to get this out. So you vomit it out on your girlfriends, on your children, someone who can't escape, basically. Or... <laughs> trap them in the car, like there are ways. Uh, so then you say, oh, we're venting, we're sharing our feelings. <laughs> we're going, Bleh. and then they're going, oh, I know, that's terrible, you poor thing. Guess what happened to me? Bleh. So it's like the vomitorium at Starbucks. We're, we're venting all our feelings. Uh, <laughs> 
and you feel relief. But nature abhors a vacuum. So when you vent, you've now created space inside. And it will be filled up with exactly what went out. It will be filled up with exactly, that's why venting is such a temporary fix and you feel relief for until you get back in your car again. Till maybe the next morning. But venting, have you noticed venting doesn't give you a permanent feeling of, well, I got that. Like if venting worked for you, like, I got that out and then I never thought or talked about it again. Right? That never happens. Right? <laughs> you just till the next person or till you mull it over again and it comes back again. This is why Byron Katie, this is where we do sort of the Byron Katie work where it all goes on paper. You vent on paper and then, this is the most important part, and this is the part I tell people this all the time and then they just conveniently forget. If you, I say, yeah, get all that out, get all that, it feels off, get it all out on paper and be petty and bitter. Be as unspiritual as you possibly can with your hatred and your vile feelings. Just empty it all out on paper. Then, you can either do the Byron Katie work if you know who she is and go through questioning and all like that, or you could just really shortcut it. This is what I teach people to do, is you write all that out. And see, the Byron Katie thing always starts with, is it true? Can I absolutely know that it's true? So I just go into my prayer. So I just turn it, you turn it over to whoever is your thing. So you can turn it over to Jesus or the Holy Spirit or the Divine Presence or whatever. So I say, I'm always, I was raised Catholic, so it's always Jesus with me, although I have upgraded to Jesus 2.0. This is the non-religious, non-historical Jesus. There's no virgin birth. There's no crucifixion. This is Jesus 2.0 intergalactic. Okay, so I just go to Jesus 2.0 and say, here are all my thoughts. I don't know if they're true. It's just all a bunch of horse shit, but this is what I'm thinking. And so I don't care about being right about this, but I surrender it all to you to sort out. I'm just giving it all to you. Now here's how I want to feel. And that's the most important part. Then you say how you want to feel. I want to feel the peace of God. I want to feel joyful again. I want my confidence back. I want to feel faith and happiness and da 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 And you write all of that out because now that is what will fill that void. Because if you're just venting, then the GPS is still set for the same destination. So you will just be filled up with the exact same energy that went out. If instead you write it down, because here's the other problem with venting. When you sit with somebody, everything that you do is multiplied because of the power of your shared thought. So if you're venting out all your negative feelings with somebody, now you've got agreement, now you've got multiplied more of the same. This is something Terry used to always say. He said, be careful what you agree with because whatever you agree with, you've got it. Yes. Right? So now, it's different if you're just saying what's happening. See, when I'm talking about venting, you know what I mean. I'm gonna describe it a little bit, but you know what I mean. I'm not saying you don't say what's happening. When you say what's happening, you're just saying what's happening. I got this diagnosis. I'm very frightened. I don't know what I'm going to do. Here's what the prognosis is. I'm seeing my doctor, da, 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 da. That's sharing the information. Venting is, and I'm going to go on and on about it, right? Sharing is, I'm in the middle of a divorce. He's trying to take the kids away from me. I'm very angry. I'm very scared. We're trying to do media mediation. It's going to court in September. I'm very worried about it. That's sharing the information. Venting is going on and on and on about it. And he's like this, and how could I have been so stupid, and you know what I found out about him, and there, da, da, da. That's venting. You see the difference? I've just shared this is what's happening, because we're not talking about hiding what's going on because you never say anything negative and pretending everything's fine when everything is not fine. That, what we're just saying, you're just sharing the information of this and how I feel. And I'm scared, and I'm angry, and I'm this, and I'm that. That's you're just sharing to let people know where you are and what's going on and saying, you know, would you hold this in truth and consciousness with me? Would you know, don't agree with me that he's an asshole. Don't agree with me that blah, 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 blah. Don't agree with all of that stuff. That is not what a spiritual companion does. They do not agree that you got fucked over. 
You understand? They agree that we have placed things under a higher authority, right? They agree with, I'm sorry, you're going through this. Is there anything I can do? I really feel for you. I'm here for you. I love you, right? That, that's support. That's love. That opens the door if they want anything from you. But you don't agree with them that the other guy's horrible and this is that, right? Like all that stuff. It's going to bite you in the ass anyhow. Because whoever that person is that they hate, when they make up with them, now you're the enemy. <laughs> right? So you just are Switzerland. Right? You're just neutral about the other person. You just go, I'm sorry that's happening. That's too bad. I know that must feel terrible for you. Is there anything I can do for you? Do you know how that just shortcuts everything? To just, because that's, isn't that the truth, really? You are sorry that they're going through that. You wish they weren't going through that. And you are there for them. Is there anything that I can do? And so, because then they can tell you. And then you can say, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I mean, you could say that. That's your truth. OK, so one of the things that I've started doing with people, as I started doing these private sessions more, I'm like, oh, OK, I get what's happening with people now. I, see, I sort of see what's going on. So one of the big things that I've started doing with people is having them start to speak out loud. We believe what we say more than anything we hear anybody else in the world say. So I can stand up here and talk until I'm blue in the face, and you can be like, oh, that's wonderful, and that's great, and da 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 But if your basic talking to yourself throughout the day is contrary to what I'm saying, you're believing you, right? So what I found was is a lot of the reason that over the years, over the 30 years of doing this, when I've had like amazing demonstrations and manifestations of things, and I have had amazing, huge demonstrations and manifestations of things, I realized sometimes the reason that it happens to me sometimes more frequently than a lot of the people who are coming is because I'm up here saying it out loud. Do you understand what, what I'm saying? Is it's not because I'm more conscious than anybody else. It's not because I'm more evolved than anybody else. It's not because I more, have more faith than anybody else. It's because I'm the one who's saying it out loud. And most spiritual people are silent. Their spirituality is silent. It's what they're reading in books and meditating upon. I'm pondering it in my heart. Right? And maybe they say an affirmation once in a fucking while. Right? That most of it is silent, is not spoken out loud. And this is in our Judeo Christian mythology, God spoke the world into existence, didn't fashion it with hands, spoke it into existence. And he said, let there be light, let there be firmament, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. And when it was all done, he said, he looked at it and said, it was good. And now all religion and spirituality has said, it is hell. Right? And this is part of the teachings of Jesus that said, and light came into the world and men preferred darkness and still do, still do. So you have to look and see where I prefer darkness and what that's costing me instead of preferring the light and speaking light as much as possible. So one of the things I started training people to do was talk to themselves in the car because you're safe there, right? Nobody's going to walk in on you saying your talk giving you your pep talk and saying your affirmations. In the car, you can put your little phone thing in and people think you're on the phone if they see you. And you're just talking, talking, talking to yourself, right? This is why, you know, the incredible popularity of someone like Joel Osteen is that groundswell of people who want joy. That's why I know it is this 
burgeoning movement of people who are tired of the darkness, who are tired of the ethos of spirituality that says, well, it's miserable here and it's hard here, but you can learn to get along and just be peaceful with the fact that life sucks, right? There's so much in spirituality that is about that, that this is the realm of the ego, and this is the realm of the this and that. No, this is a fabulous realm, but people's stories shit all over it all the time, right? There's, I always say, there's some woman right now in Beverly Hills who is telling a horrible story about having to pack her Louis Vuitton for Paris tomorrow. And she is in mountainous waves of self-pity. I cannot believe that I have to do this. There's the course, this is the maid's day off today of all days. Well, we just got back from Hawaii and the kids are hungry and now I have to pack for Paris and it's not fair. And it's, I do everything myself, right? And then she goes to see Deepak Chopra. No, I, this is no lie. I actually was at a Deepak, the one time I heard Deepak Chopra speak was when he first moved into um, La Costa. When he had moved from the center in La Jolla, he moved to La Costa. And I was, and it was like a free evening and he was giving a talk and it was the, his bookstore was open and there was this woman there. And this is a judgment and fuck you, I don't care. Uh, this woman, <laughs> this woman, this like, you know, and. Listen, this is nothing about rich people. I love rich people. Most of the rich people that I know are fabulous, amazing people, very generous and wonderful people. But this was just a certain mentality. And it was this mentality of, and this is what's so amazing to me. I see this in spiritual groups. Uh, not so much anyway. Certainly, it, would, it happened in Santa Barbara at various times where people would come in and just have this, like I just wanted to say, excuse me, other people in the world, like you're in this big spiritual group and you act like, like you're the only person in the, like you come in and you make a lot of noise during the meditation and you, as you're going in the row, you smack people in the head with your purse and you don't apologize to them. And, and then you're talking about, oh, I read a return to love. It changed my whole life because I'm all about love now, <laughs> except for you fucking little people. But I mean, I love people on my level who also have jets. I really love those people. So I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? So. There was this woman who, so we, we were at the bookstore and we were in line and this woman with all of her big jewelry and everything walked up and just butted right in front of me like I didn't even exist and just ignored like, sh like she didn't even see me or acknowledge that there were other people in the world. Then she sat in the front row and everything that Deepak said, she was like, oh yeah, I, I have all of his tapes and I just want to dance. <laughs> you are a fucking moron, okay? No offense, no judgment. That's just a description <laughs> of your wonderful spiritual growth. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, there's that, that, and then that's the, exactly the kind of person who will go into mountainous waves of self-pity over, I cannot believe that they don't have valet here and I had to walk from da da da. Now, poor people can do the exact same thing. My father was like that and we were dirt poor and had food stamps and all that stuff. And he would go into mountainous waves of self-pity how the government was out to screw him personally. Like the, to him, the whole government was, ag was against Tom Glass. Like the, and well, I mean, when the president came through, like the secret service, checked him out because he had written letters. So, you know, they did kind of know about him. <laughs> I will give him that. They did sort of know a little bit about him. Uh, <laughs> but it was not a vendetta. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? That you can tell whatever story you want and you will be at the effect of the story that you're telling. And so we have to be inherently interested in happiness and joy and abundance and goodness even though there's shit that goes, listen, I'm telling all of this. So many times, the people that I'm hearing talk about the darkness of the world and the this and the that, you look at their lives and you go like, like two or three things happened to you that were kind of normal things. Like I, I can tell a story about, you know, my parents were both dead by the time that I was 40, including my sister and my grandparents and all my aunts and uncles and classmates that I grew up with. I was beaten and bullied all through school, spit on, teachers kicked me all kinds of shit that happens. I can tell you all kinds of horrible stories, but the story is, they're not 
not here now. <laughs> right? And for so many people, it's like, you're still acting like that person is still spitting on you and kicking you and doing shit to you, right? I mean, uh, yes, I miss my parents, but they're here. I feel them in spirit, and I'm not miserable about it. And it's very infrequently that it actually is a feeling of, like, real, like, oh, I wish they were here. I don't. They've been gone for a long time now, like 15 and 17 years, I think, now. Probably, actually, I think a little bit longer even than that. But I know people who the only time that they post on Facebook is about the anniversary of someone's death 20 years ago. Mom, I still miss you every day, 20 years later. And it's like, it's funny, because when she was alive, the shit that you said did not indicate that you would miss her every day. I'm just saying. But now, all of a sudden, <laughs> because it helps me to be miserable in my present, I want to keep that activated in me. Right? Because it's consistent with life is suffering and we lose everything that we love and da da da, all that kind of stuff. Um, yes, loss is inevitable. We're all going to have loss all the time. That's part of life, is loss. That's what Buddha was saying is you want to try to create a situation in which there is no loss and you're living in a world where it's endless loss, but it is also endless gain. It's continual loss and gain, loss and gain. People come and go, money comes and goes, people come and go, health comes and goes, and it all comes back around again. And it's important to know that all these things are seasonal. Now, we're very spoiled, of course, here in California because we just have, you know, fire season. That's really the season that we have. We just have the regular weather, then fire season. <laughs> so it seems sort of like it's just nice mostly all the time. So we're not used to <laughs> the idea that all oh, things do really change. And so, you don't, we don't live in a, most of the world, most of the country doesn't live in a perpetual summer or spring. So they get used to the idea of there's a time when things go dormant. So there are times in your life when it's going to be loss and dormancy, just like winter. But you don't freak out over winter. You I grew up in Pennsylvania. In the wintertime, we didn't go, it must be the end of the world. There is no fruit on the trees. They are all sticks now, and there is ice covering the ground. We are all going to die, right? I mean, you could also go out to the ocean, and if you didn't understand how nature worked, when the tide goes out, you could run screaming after it, what is happening? <laughs> right? But because we know, or when night comes, what happened to the sun is gone. Right? But we know everything is cycle. We know the sun is going to come back again. The tide will come back in again. And this is everything in your life. When you get sick, you will get well again. Right? When you, you have money and then you have seasons when you don't have money, your business is up and your business is down. And if you just look at it as a season, this is just a season, right? That we have sowing and reaping and growing and resting. Those are the four seasons, and your life is never, it, like all the areas of your life can be in different seasons. You could be reaping in relationship and in a season of resting in your business. So there's not much going on in your business. So resting is what? Resting is the winter time. There's nothing to do. You can't sow, you're not growing, and you're not reaping. But it's not death because it's all just dormant under the ground. The tree is not dead. Right? It, but the leaves are gone, and it's going to go through a season. So I remember hearing Marianne Williamson talk about people who've been married for a long time who are in long-term relationships thinking of their relationship like a rose bush, that the romance is full bloom. But romance is not something that lasts an entire marriage. It's a season, and it will go, but then it will come back around again. Right? It'll Like the romance will fall off like the rosebuds fall off and there goes the dormancy where it's just, you're just doing your thing, right? You're going to work, you're taking care of each other, but it's not like, there he is again, <laughs> right? You're just like, yeah, there he is again. <laughs> right? <laughs> again, every day, there he is. Again. 
right? But then if you just keep the season going and you don't chop down the bush, let's say like this fucking bush, right? You just go wait and you just keep, and it comes back around and the spring comes and you water it and all those things and then it comes back and then you go, oh, there he is again. There he is again. And you don't think that things are not supposed to change. That's what Buddha was trying to say, is that you don't think that you're going to get to a great place and then stay there. Something that I teach people all the time is, is that this thing with goals and moving in the direction of what you want, it's the reason that you have to enjoy the journey is because you will never arrive. And one of the things is, is that if your life is thinking that when I get there, I'll be happy, you have to understand that the line is moving as you are. Right? He's like, I, oh, I'm making so much progress toward my goal. <laughs> right? But it's moving with you most of the time. That's the whole idea of that mindset, which is, <sighs> and you realize, oh, it's not about getting there. It's about enjoying the journey to there. But if you don't have a there to go to, life is very boring. You have to have a reason to wake up in the morning. And it doesn't have to be, my life's purpose. It can be lunch. <laughs> to me, lunch is like Christmas every day. Sometimes as I'm going to sleep at night, I want to go to bed early to get to lunch tomorrow. It gets me out of bed in the morning thinking about lunch. And then when lunch is over, then I go home for my nap and start thinking about lunch tomorrow. <laughs> right? So it's not about having, thank you, Joel. It's not about having some enormous thing that you're headed towards. But it, I mean, it can just be, you know, I want to see my grandchildren on the weekends. I want to see, you know, those flowers bloom in the whatever. All right. I didn't even. He said five minutes, and I'm thinking, I'm ready to start the talk. Um, I'm almost ready to start the talk. <laughs> so I'm going to squeeze this in, because this is what I wanted to say, is how I started to get people to say affirmations. This is what Catherine Ponder says. For every 15 minutes of study, you need five minutes of verbal affirmations. I want you to start to think that way. For every 15 minutes of reading any spiritual book, followed up with five minutes of verbal affirmations. You are prophesying into your life, your future, when you speak the word like that. Because the study, let me see if I put this down here. Here it is. Study helps you know about the truth. Affirmation helps you release and activate the truth. So all the time that we're just reading, we're just learning about the truth. We're not practicing the truth. It's the affirmations that actually activate what we read. And that's why Joel Goldsmith is so great, because he talks so much, and so much of his stuff is about what you're saying to yourself. The story of his mother when she had cancer, and she just talked herself in Bible verses, because she was a Christian, so she knew the Bible. So, and she basically healed herself of cancer, by, because she had done everything medically she could, and they sent her home to die. So she just went home and healed herself. And she did it by, she said, if you would go over to mom's house, you would hear her talking through the house. So upstairs, you, that's how you could find her, because she'd be talking. And she was saying biblical quotes to herself, I shall live and not die. And I would say, mother, how are you feeling today? Well, Joel, I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might. <laughs> right? Talk about not going into mountainous waves of self-pity. Right? She was speaking, prophesying into her life what she wanted to be true for her until the cancer was gone. Now, that doesn't mean that she was healed or not healed because there are people whose bodies die and that's their healing. But she would have died totally peacefully and in love with God. So it wasn't really about, do you understand? Because you could also heal your cancer in that it wouldn't be healing, but you could cure your cancer and still be miserable. So that would not be a true healing, it would just be a cure. You get the difference? Okay, so we're looking at healing our lives, not just curing outward conditions. Because when we heal, and that's why Louise Hay said, you can heal your life, that's the internal experience that we're having of life. So, we at the end of the CD? Thank you so much. Give yourself some applause. 
but I'm not done with you. We're just done with the CD. Okay. Um, so, so to me, there really is not, vibrationally, there's no difference between love and joy. And the word love gets bandied about a lot in New Thought circles when I think what we really should be thinking about is joy because too often when people say love, what they really mean is a kind of sentimentality attachment. And what they really mean is affection. And love is much bigger than affection. And real love is about behavior anyhow. But love is something that's demonstrated. Listen, love, there's so much trying to come out. The three things that I talk about the most and have for many, many years now are love, joy, and peace. And love, joy, and peace are the first three fruits of the Spirit. When I talk, as I do so often, that what we're doing in order for it to be real and not just something that you sit in the front row of a Deepak Chopra seminar nodding your head about, for it to be real, it must bear fruit in your life. And if it's bearing fruit, other people will see it. They will know something is different about you by observing you and being with you. But the fruit is not things. So when I talk about your garden and the place where you're growing spiritual fruit, it doesn't mean you walk out into your garden and there was a car growing from the tree because that's not spiritual fruit. That can be a form of a kind of consciousness of prosperity. But spiritual fruit is, you can look it up in the scriptures. There's nine of them. I can't remember what they all are, but they're, they're love, peace, joy, patience, self-control, um, I think generosity, kindness. I can't remember what the other ones are. But these are things that are planted in us as seeds by the universe. Gifts are given. So the gifts of God are freely given. It's only a gift if you didn't do anything for it. Otherwise, it's pay, right? So there are gifts of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are things that you have to do something to develop. Fruit is developed. You cultivate fruit. If you have a garden with fruit trees in it, you have to cultivate that. So you have to take action to, have, to cultivate spiritual fruit. So you have to do something to cultivate love, something to cultivate patience. Now you may have, your personality type may be somebody that you don't have to do much because you're just one of those people who's naturally patient or you're just, you're just naturally joyful or you're just naturally whatever. But th there will still be other things that are just seeds that you have to do something to cultivate them. Like to just say, I have no patience is your own fault. Because patience is a seed that every one of us has that we have to cultivate. I've told a story recently about Joseph Campbell tells a story about his, well, not anymore. Well, maybe he does in heaven, I don't know, wherever he is, I don't know. But he would tell a story about his wife, Jean. I think his, her name was Jean. In fact, he was, he was asking Alan Watts, you know, the great Zen philosopher, Alan Watts. He was saying to him that he, his, the, the issue that he had with Jean was that Jean was late for everything. And they lived in New York, and he said, he said, well, women, first of all, it, it takes them longer because they have to do more stuff. Like, you know, a man can just pretty much walk out the door, but a woman, she has like makeup and this and that. And so he was like, it takes her longer to get ready. And in her mind, if we're supposed to be somewhere at 7.30, she thinks that's when you're supposed to start to get ready, 7.30. So he said we were, she was always late and it would drive him crazy. And they'd been married for years and it was driving him crazy. And he said to Alan Watts, he said, you know, it just makes me insane. And the problem is, is that then when she comes, when we're supposed to meet, when she comes, then I end up being kind of nasty, which I don't want to be, and it just is horrible. And so what Alan Watts said to him was, oh, well, the problem is, is that you think that she should be there on time. <laughs> right? This is, I could do a whole seminar just on that right there, of just like all the things that you think people should be doing according to the way that you know, your brochure. This is how decent people live, right? You have that brochure, this is how decent people live, and you can't believe other people are not, what is wrong with you? This is, this is insane. So he said, well, the problem is that you think that she should be there at that time, and so within that, that so what is that? 
It's a paradigm. So his paradigm is you show up, 731 is late for 730. That's your paradigm, right? And that paradigm, so you look at your paradigm, you don't see, is my paradigm right or wrong? You say, does my paradigm cause suffering or peace? Does it bring me joy or suffering? That's what you want to ask yourself about your paradigm. Not whether it's right or wrong. That's a moral question. And morality is man-made. It has nothing to do with God. All morality is man-made because it changes from religion to religion to religion. Even religions that use the same spiritual books. Do you understand that? Religions that use the same spiritual books will have different morality. One group of people who use that book will say, all life is precious, all life matters, we must all get along. Another group that uses that exact same book will say, it is God's will that I slaughter all the people who are having sex outside of marriage, who are gay, who are da-da-da-da. So morality is all man-made. You have to understand that, that when we talk about the moral order and the moral this, that's man-made, that's a paradigm that you've bought into as this is what people are supposed to do, and this is what people are not supposed to do, right? So with, within that place, he had a thing, people should be on time, and da-da-da-da. So Alan Watts said, well, your problem is, is that you think that she should be on time, so you're living outside of basically the paradigm of the joy and the peace and the love that you want. So just that seed was enough for Joseph Campbell to say, I'm not making good use of this time when I'm waiting for her. Because while I'm waiting for her, I'm just resenting her living in a story of she's not doing what I want her to do. So he said, I used that as my spiritual practice so that what I began to do, and this is what we're talking about today. He said, so what I began to do was look to see what there was good that around me that I was missing while I was in my story of she should be here. So he said, I started realizing there were, you know, museums to look at, there were fountains to see, there were people to talk to. He said, I really started to get into it so that he said then I would start to hope that Jean would be late. <laughs> Do you see, that's healing. That's not curing, that's healing. So what was that? That was his development of the spiritual fruit of patience. It didn't just come, you can't just pray for patience. You don't just pray for apples. If you have an apple tree out back, right? You have to do something. You might have to prune the tree. You might have insects that you need to take care of. You might have, like, you needs to be watered, might need to be fertilized. Like, there are things that you do to develop spiritual fruit. So we are, this is why the scripture says, you are known by the fruit that you bear. So you might write best-selling books on love and forgiveness and peace, but if you're a raging bitch, people behind the scenes, that's your fruit. You have rotten fruit. Even though you write best-selling books, you have rotten fruit. So write, you can be Anne Lamott and write all these wonderful books about grace and love and da-da-da-da, and then you can sit there, but you have rotten fruit. So it'll look like, if people think fruit is stuff, it'll look like, well, you're a number one New York Times bestseller, you probably made a lot of money for that, you were on this and that talk show, but the fruit is your aura, and the aura of her story is, writing is hard, you just have to make yourself do it, you have to put it in three hours a day, the whole world is just a collective, endless heartbreak, but you can find little moments of grace in it. I was like, holy shit, that sounds awful. <laughs> right? Like, like for years when I read all those Pema Chodron books until I wanted to be happy. Right? She's very good for just making peace with suffering and misery. Like she's the queen of, you can have absolute peace with your suffering. Like she's been meditating and teaching meditation for 150 years and I would still hear her say, it's still hard. I'm like, what the fuck? It's still hard? Are you insane? I would say then, that's not your path. If after 40 years it's still hard, that's not your fucking path. <laughs> You're on the wrong fucking path. <laughs> right? 
When you hear Esther Hicks talk about meditation, it's a completely different story. She said, oh, Jerry and I had never meditated before, and you know, we went to see this channel, and Theo said, oh, you should meditate. And we said, well, what do you mean by that? We thought that meditation was like people who sat on beds of nails, right? Pema children. We thought that's what that was. Like, you have to suffer and just, oh, the monkey mind, and it will fight you, and oh, the monkey mind, and you'll be distracted, and the suffering, it will never end. The monkey mind will be after you till the day that you die, but by God, you did 20 minutes. Right? So Esther says, we didn't know what it was, and they said, oh, wear comfortable clothing, sit in a comfortable chair, and just close your eyes, and just observe your breathing for 20 minutes. And so Esther says, well, Jerry and I thought, oh, well, what you do? And we said it was kind of embarrassing. To, and they said, do it together, because it'll be more powerful if you do it together. So she said, we sat down in our, they had like barca loungers, and we had a, you know, adage or whatever between us, because we were kind of embarrassed. We didn't want to look at you. So we closed our eyes, she said, Esther, <laughs> so Abraham tells the story, says, Esther closed her eyes, and within moments, her whole body was just vibrating. Every cell was just vibrating. She had never felt so alive. And when the buzzer went off in 20 minutes, she said, let's do it again. <laughs> okay, that's your fucking path. That's your path. <laughs> that's your path. It's like, it was so great, and I was buzzing. I said, let's do it again. And then when it went off in 20 minutes, Esther said again, let's do it again. Right? Not... After 40 years, every day, I put in those fucking 20 minutes. <laughs> Breathing back to the thought again. So I would listen to all these things, and I would think, why am I not getting any happier? And at one time, I heard her say, and God love her. At, the, at that level, that's, she's providing a service for that paradigm. Same thing with Anne Lamott. With people who are within that paradigm, that's the teacher you want, is somebody who knows how to make peace with suffering because you're not going to stop suffering in that paradigm, because the paradigm is about the acceptance of that kind of suffering, not joy and peace as a possibility other than just moments, just boom, moment, then it's gone, boom, right? So I heard her say, because I think it was in, a, I either saw it in a book, but I think I heard her say it, because I was listening to a live seminar thing where she said, I always forget about the joy. I was driving, I said, I always forget about the joy, and I was like, <laughs> out the window, we're done. <laughs> I'm divorcing you. No, that's why I have not been happy. I'm following a teacher who constantly forgets about joy. Right? <laughs> it's so insane. <laughs> I mean, it's supposed to be fun. That's why, you know, Esther and Jerry, they would travel around the country in this, what they called the monster bus, which was this huge mobile home thing. And the bumper sticker on the back, she said, People saw that bumper sticker and they either hated it or loved it, she said, because it was, I, I, I think it was something that Jerry had, had made, and the bumper sticker said, life is supposed to be fun. And there were people who were like, how dare you? <laughs> right? But there are other people who would pass me, beep, 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 woo, yeah, life's supposed to be fun, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's a decision. It's a decision. That's what A Course in Miracles says. It says it is a decision, that happiness is a decision. Even Abraham Lincoln, who suffered with clinical depression, times in his life when he would not leave his bed, is famous for the quote, a man is about as happy as he makes up his mind to be. Makes up his mind to be. I've made up my mind to be happy. I've made up my mind to enjoy life, to enjoy this journey to enjoy the process. There are gonna be things that I don't like, of course. But I cannot just go for the form, I have to go for the content. I was talking to, you know, I'm talking to people now because uh, that's my new paradigm. I'm actually talking to people and I'm letting them talk to me too, within limits. But <laughs> up to a point, I'm breaking myself in. Um, but it's wonder, but it's like, I, see the thing is, I do love people. I love people. But I also know people are crazy. All of us, not just some people. We're all fucking cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. It's just levels of degree. Like, it's just how crazy. Like, I'm just, ha like, there's a level where you're like, yeah, you're just a little not crazy enough for me, or just a little too crazy for me. But there's a pretty wide band wherever you are of match. This is the level of crazy I'm comfortable with. So I was talking to someone the other day, and, and I'm older. You know, like, like 
there are people now who are a lot younger than me that come to talk to me and stuff like that. So I ha I've managed to, you know how you get older is you just don't die. So I have not died. So it, that like you just are sort of like, oh yeah, I've experienced a certain amount of life. So people will talk. So somebody was talking to me, someone who's significantly younger than me, and then they were talking about someone who was significantly, not significantly, but you know, maybe a decade younger than them. And, and just sort of talking about the differences. And it was talking about this person who was, I think, like 25 or 26, and saying, like, I want to know where this relationship is going and if I'm just wasting my time. And I'm like, yeah, see, when you're 26, you think it's possible to waste time. <laughs> like, that's one of the concepts that you have, is that it's possible to waste time because you don't realize everything counts. See, you only think, when you're 26, you think it only counts if it's going to end to the, in the thing that you wanted it to end in. You know, this is a waste if it doesn't end in what I wanted it to end in. Instead of saying, like, no, this is your whole life. Like, did you ever watch that movie, Harold and Maude? Love that movie. So there's that line where, where Ruth Gordon says to the younger guy about making mistakes and getting out there and, and just doing all the stupid things. He says, she says, what else are you going to have to talk about in the locker room? Like, at the end, you're going to have to have stories. You're going to want to look back. The, someone gave, you know, the Far Side cartoons? You know, relax, because we're going to be here a while. The Far Side cartoons, I can feel myself just still with lots to go. Um, so the Far Side cartoons, there was a car, somebody gave me a card one time that uh, it was all of these spiders sitting on a porch in their rocking chairs, and the sign above said, the old spider home. So it was for, like, they're all old and the old spider home they'd gone to. And the one spider saying to the other, there's, like, three other spiders, and the one spider says, did I ever tell you guys about the time that the fly flew right in my mouth? <laughs> and one of the other spiders down on the end, his thought bubble is only about a million times. <laughs> so it's, it's like that. Like you want to be able to, at the end of your life, have stories to tell because, but when you're young, that's, you don't want that. You don't want to, uh, to have like, I had all these adventures and these, you know, I had these love affairs and I, that you want to know like, I went point A and point B and I have a five year plan. I'm 25 years behind on my five year plan. Just if you're interested in where I am in my five year plan, 25 years behind my five year plan. But the distinctions that you make that have to do with form of well, that relationship because it didn't end in marriage and a house and a baby, it, was a waste of my time, or it didn't matter, or whatever. But here's the thing, to come around to the beginning, is when I say love, I know so much more about love now than I did when I thought about love all the time. And that's why I think it makes me cry, is because you feel the love in a situation that 25 years ago, the love would have been there, but you wouldn't have felt it because you thought it looked different. You didn't recognize it, and I remember, you know when you just fall in love with somebody, but it's not sexual? Do you know what I mean? Like, I think of it like when you, like there are people that you fall in love, like you fall in love with a dog. Do you know, like how you fall in love with a dog because you're not thinking you're going to bring so much to this relationship. You know, do you know what I mean? Like it's a really, it's just, the, it just is like, I just love to see you. And when I'm at work, I think about you, you know, but I don't think, I hope he's not playing with other dogs. <laughs> right? You don't have that thing of like, oh, you know, I'm going to be the only one that dog ever thinks about. And so I remember hearing Mary Ann say this thing when, when really in the middle of the whole AIDS crisis when people were dying left and right. And she said, I have been to a lot of deathbeds where people were at that peaceful place. You know, they'd accepted, they knew that that was what was coming and they said their goodbyes and all that. And she said, I've never been in an experience like that where somebody said, I know you love me, but are you in love with me? Oh. Right? You get that you don't care. Like that, that those distinctions are so stupid that that is the immature mind when you still think that this should go to this, should go to this, should go to this, should go to this, and that there's such a thing as wasted time, that even the things that ended badly, it wasn't a wasted time. Like even that horrible thing, how juicy and delicious and wonderful it was, when you look back at it, of like, ah, 
Wow, God, we were crazy. That was some fucking cheap drama. Right? I mean, you don't do that anymore, but that's why you can appreciate it now. It's like, God, remember when I had that kind of energy? <laughs> now you're like, who has that kind of energy <laughs> to mess with that bullshit? <laughs> like, you just don't. No, it's just the love where I'm just so in love with you. I just think of you. There are so many people in my life now where I'm like that, where I'm like, I'm just mentally stalking you. I'm just mentally on you, like I'm just on you. I mean, because there are a lot of people where, there are people who get my recordings for many, many years. And so, particularly if they're getting CDs, I am do everything, there's nobody else to do anything. So I'm literally doing every single fucking thing. So I'm putting the postage on and putting the mailing label on and putting the affirmation card in and putting the label on the CD and putting in all this stuff. And when I'm seeing their name every week, it's like I'm just flooded with feelings of love for sometimes people I've never even seen. But I feel that feeling of like, oh, I'm so stalking you. Like where people that I just think about them every day, where I'm thinking about, I wonder if they heard that part of the CD and I wonder if that helped them and I wonder if that brought them peace and I wonder if they brought them any joy. And it's that kind of like, it's a love that has nothing to do with, are they gonna send me a card? Right? Am I gonna be like up there on the top priority list of blah, 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 blah. Like all that stuff just is all the form of stuff. It's just all of the, the, the form out there of things that you know comes and goes all the time. There are people that I very rarely see and I literally think about them every single day. But you know, I have that kind of time. You probably have a life. I have that kind of time. I can think about things all fucking day long. I can go through a list of 100 people of like, you know, whatever they're doing and they're doing and they're doing because there's nobody in the apartment talking to me. Well, I went, <laughs> I really don't know what's wrong with me. I went, uh, one of the things that I said last week, this is crazy. Uh, I said in my Wednesday class, I said, listen, d again, this is the year of Donald Trump. Donald Trump is just the poster boy for new thought. And you just have to really, you really do. You just have to, he is just it on so many fucking levels. And he, like, he is living new thought because it is absolute proof that it's all 100% consciousness. It has nothing to do with talent or intelligence or history or any fucking thing else. It really is just your consciousness, right? I mean, because he's held no other political office. He has no anything. I'm not even saying he would be a bad president. I don't have any fucking idea. I'm just saying that he is only there because of his consciousness and not because of anything else. And that that's really it, that all of the, again, the deprogramming of this stuff that we live in a culture that's all about hard work. And you can just slave yourself down to bony fingers and still live in squalor. If, because you've bought into a certain consciousness. There are people who say, I posted something on Instagram and somebody got kind of upset about it, so I took it down because I'm not here to upset people. You know, and it, wasn't, and it wasn't something that I said, it was something I had posted that Napoleon Hill had said, but this person kind of took, talked about, well, but that's true, but the disenfranchised and the system doesn't work for them and the da 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 And I was like, I'm not gonna get into a big discussion on Instagram, you know, but that's not really the truth. That's in the world of what we believe is we say, well, the system holds people down and the da 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 but it doesn't. It's your belief in the system. If you don't believe in the system, you can't be held down by the system. But if you look to the system and you think that it has power, then it will appear to hold you down. But that's why the people who aren't held down by it are not held down by it because they didn't believe in it. Or they bought into it and worked their way out of it and now they're workaholics. Right? They keep in that place because they believe that it's hard work where there are other people who are working hard and not making it forward because they believe in the system. But it really is just your consciousness. And so I always remember that, <clears throat> I can't remember his name, but he was a, a African-American guy in the civil rights movement around the time of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And I had never heard of him before, but I heard this quote that I never forgot that is, again, it's the whole essence of new thought. And he was talking about this whole idea when he said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor 
is the mind of the oppressed. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. You know, and I, you know, listen, I rag on Oprah because it's not hurting her. She's not thinking in Montecito, I hope Jacob likes me. Okay, trust me. And I do like her, but she's not worried about shit that I'm saying about her. It's not hurting her. And I mention her a lot because everybody knows who she is. I don't have to give you a backstory on Oprah. I think that what she's done is phenomenal. I also think that she believes a lot of crazy shit, and it makes her suffer. But one of the reasons that she was able to rise to where she was is because the oppressor never had her mind. And she, on that first interview she gave with Barbara Walters, like back in the 1980s, she said to Barbara Walters, this was before all the big shit happened. Like it was the first year of her talk show and she had just done The Color Purple and that was it. She was still doing crappy fighting talk shows like where people fought and shit. This was before she did Change Your Life TV and stuff. So she was just a talk show host who'd done one movie. And she said to Barbara Walters, I've always known that I was born for greatness. She had the same thing stacked against her, but she didn't believe it. So she said, those things don't apply to me because I don't even consider them. I don't think about it. And the other thing that she said, this was brilliant, and it, it, it's something to know in terms, again, of consciousness, is she said, when I first was in Chicago and I started wanting to really give back and to help people, she said, and I think Stedman and her did this, that she said, I started work, she said she started working with like youth in Chicago. So this was years before she went and did her school for girls in Africa. And she said, it didn't work. She said, because I found that I could not help delinquents. Now, why would that be? Because our consciousness was too different. You have to be vibrationally close enough in consciousness to someone to lift them up. If they're too far vibrationally from where you are in consciousness, you are not the person to help them. Do you understand how that works? Because what she said was when she then went to do her school for girls in Africa, she said they were not delinquents. They were in situations that were worse in, some, in many cases than the delinquents I was helping in Chicago. So they had more poverty more, some of them were orphans who were living practically on their own and didn't have clean water and were walking miles to get water and all this stuff. What made them closer in consciousness was their ambition. So they were all people who had excelled with what little education they had and really wanted a better life. Whereas the people, the delinquents that she would work with, believed the system. They believe that, well, we're screwed and someone has to save us and that the only way we're going to get out is if you, and she talked about trying to help people, like we would get them jobs and we would get them apartments and we would get them this and we would get them that and they would lose it all and they would this and they would that because they were still in the mindset within the oppressed system. Their mind was still oppressed even when they were being lifted out of the circumstances. You get how that w operates? So that, that's how consciousness operates. That's how we gradually change our consciousness. We keep moving up and up and up to become more free and more free and more free. So one of the things that I started teaching too was we have to stop thinking of work as bondage time. I have my bondage time and then free time. Like Abraham always says, you're so free you can choose bondage. Right? The mind of the oppressed. If you think of work, my bondage time, then I get off, you are not enjoying a lot of your journey. There's a significant portion of your journey that you don't enjoy because it's your bondage time, and then you get to be free. So what do you change? Your attitude. If you can change your job, great. But if you can't, change your attitude. So I talked about this the other week, and somebody wrote me and said, Another great thing that entered into my heart from Wednesday night is to not partition my life into work time, free time, play time, etc. So now I say out loud every morning, I enjoy every minute of my day. That, you have to start by saying it. You start, it begins, you speak the word. In the beginning was the word. 
In the beginning is the word. We're waiting for things to change so we can say it different. No, in the beginning is the word, then the change comes after you speak it differently. I enjoy every minute of my day. Now, that's a grappling hook. You throw that out as a grappling hook because maybe every part of your day is not that enjoyable, right? If you're taking care of somebody, you have an aging parent who has dementia or something and is screaming at you that why are you doing this to me? And you're, That's not an enjoyable moment, is it? So we're not saying, oh, pretend. Da, 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 da. That's not an enjoyable moment. So your grappling hook is, uh, is, okay, since this is not a moment that seems to be filled with joy, then somehow I have to move myself into a place where this is a temporary experience. How can I make peace with this and look past what's happening? Right? That's the discipline. It takes discipline if it were, if every situation just lined up immediately, you know, it'd be easy. But once you get in the practice, then the situations do start to line up more immediately because you get momentum going. So one of the things I was talking about also last week was on Wednesday, I said, I said, God, we don't want the life we deserve. Who wants the life you fucking deserve? Oh my God, no. That's the, oh, that's like a, no, no. I want a life way better than the life I deserve. And I don't mean that in terms of, oh, I'm a bad person. I mean, we think of deserve as something you've earned. Don't you want more than you're earning? I want enough to share and to spare. I want to be playing way over my head. I want to be in places I have no business being. Like Donald Trump. <laughs> right? He has no business being there. But he's like, of course I'm here. That's what I want. I want to be in places I have no fucking business being there. I want to walk in and people go, how did he get in? <laughs> like, right? I'm just like, don't, isn't that, like, there, the, so you just say, I want to be playing way the fuck over my head. I want to be in places I don't deserve at all. So, so I just said that. And then, so, and I was, um, I was, yeah, so like, Thursday? Yeah, so that was Wednesday. So the next night, I'm laying in bed, because that's all I have. I turn my apartment into a studio apartment, so I have an office. The bedroom is an office. That's where I see clients, and I have my desk and stuff. And then my living room, I just have a king-size bed and a television, because that's all I need. So I'm laying in my king-size bed in my night clothes, as I do every day, starting around 3. And I was just <laughs> sailing into, you know, right preparing for lunch the next day. So I'm laying there, and I'm like, you know, and it's kind of, it was sort of hot, so, I was, and I would just eaten a, like a big meal. Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to tell you. I'm at my goal weight. I hit my goal weight. I've been working and working and working and working at it, and I just hit it this morning, and you can too. Here's what I did. I changed it. So... It was 155, and then this morning, I made it 170. So I hit my goal weight this morning, so that was fabulous. That's a big win. So I was laying there on my king-size bed, bloated from eating to keep my weight up uh, at 170 because I didn't want to fall below. So I was laying there bloated and made me a little bit sweaty and watched TV, and I get this text from <laughs> my friend Jason. And he goes, I just got two, this was like at 7 o'clock or something like that, uh, or maybe even after something, he goes, I just got these magical tickets to see, um, uh, oh God, now I can't remember his name, <laughs> just Brian Ferry. I just got these magical tickets to see Brian Ferry in concert downtown tonight, do you want to go? And I was like, I'm not fucking going to do that. Like, I never go anywhere and leave the house or go anywhere at night and all that. That's like, I don't want to do that. And it was interesting because I had just that morning, as many people are starting to do, as we talked about it, in my morning pages, I said to the universe, I want a present today. So I'd said the night before, I want to just be like in places that I have no business being and all this stuff. So then the text comes, you want to go to this concert? I'm like, no. I didn't say no, but I just thought, I'm not a spontaneous person. You know, you call me, give me a week, and then I think about it and I consult the cards. Like, <laughs> I don't do all that. But, <laughs> but I have been notoriously, you know, not a spontaneous person. But I like it. 
But it was like, do you want to go? And you'd have to go right now. And so I knew I didn't have time to shower, and I'm too fat for my pants, and I'm sweaty, and I've just eaten this enormous meal, and I don't want to drive here, and all, all this stuff. And I was like, I'm not going to do it. And then I remembered, oh, I asked the universe for a present. So I just texted back, hell yeah. <laughs> so I ended up driving over to my friend's house, and we went to the concert, and it just flowed. Like, it was just so, I went over to his house, and then he drove, and we, and it was so funny because we went into the, parking lot. I mean, it was just, and he's so fabulous and so funny and has so many wonderful, great stories and such a great heart and made everything like really super easy. And we met two of his other friends there. And it was so funny because we were, because I am totally old school. So we went into the parking lot and then they went in the parking lot. So, you know, here, this free concert because he had been given tickets. And so we go in the parking lot and they go, $30 to park. It was $30 to park. <laughs> and he goes, I don't have any cash. And I said, I have cash. And he said, you have cash? You have $30 in cash? And I was like, you know, when I pull out cash, it's like I have pulled out the Willy Wonka golden ticket because no one sees cash anymore. No one knows what it looks like. Like there's a whole generation of people who are like, you have cash? What are you doing with cash? What is that? Can I smell it? It's weird. That's, oh, wow, that's cash. So it was just, so the whole thing was just fun. And then we went out to a bar afterwards, the, the Dresden room where this old couple who are like as old as Adam and Eve have been doing a lounge act for like the last 50 years or something like that. It's like, it's in the paper, you can see it. I think I linked to it on my Facebook page. And so we were just sitting there drinking, you know, vodka and listening to these. And I was up until one in the morning and I was like, who the fuck am I? I like this guy. He has no right to be here at all. He's a 102 years old, crotchety old fuck that goes to bed at three. Right? But if you just change your story, you just change the things you're saying. But then when it happens, you have to say yes and get out of and get through the resistance that will come up. Because the answer comes, and with the answer comes the resistance. Here's the concert, it's all magic, it's all wonderful, do you want to go? No, it's too soon. <laughs> it's too much good too soon. <laughs> Wait till I drop 15 pounds and go shopping. <laughs> right? <laughs> but I just went, you know, I just put on, and I was like, I probably don't smell good because I didn't have time to shower. I just brushed my teeth quickly and threw on, you know, a caftan and out the door I went. <laughs> and I am your spiritual leader. Doesn't that scare you? It should frighten the shit out of you. Let me just make sure there was nothing else that I needed to tell you. <sighs> Oh, the prayer of Jabez. I will, let, I, will let, I will end with this. This is another good one to do. For those of you who are not familiar, when I first started lecturing here in 2000 was when that little book came out, The Prayer of Jabez, which is based on an Old Testament prayer called The Prayer of Jabez. And <laughs> this stuff is real hard, right? It's very, very deep and hard to get. I hope you're getting it all. Uh, so... <laughs> this, and it's a tiny little book, but this Christian minister basically found it in, and started using it in his seminars. And so he made a little book called The Prayer of Jabez, which is it's only like five or six lines. And it, it is this, this farmer named Jabez who has, was basically praying for more land because he wanted to prosper and thrive. So his prayer was, was bless me and expand my boundaries and enlarge my territory because he wanted more pasture land. And then the last line of it is, and God granted him favor and gave him what he wanted. And so basically, this minister started using this prayer because it was so contrary in his thought system to what the religious spiritual life was, which was one that focused entirely on other people. Because here was somebody who was saying, bless me, expand my boundaries, enlarge my territory. And so it shifted this minister's paradigm. And part, a little story that he tells in there that I never did know if it was something that actually happened to him or if he was just saying it, of 
like being at a conference and there's this older minister who's like a mentor to so many people who's this spiritual giant. They're all staying in this hotel and he's walking past the room where this minister is praying by himself in his room in the morning and he was kind of wanting to listen in on what he, because he's praying out loud to hear like this spiritual giant's prayers. Were they going to be for like restoration of the church or the forgiveness of sins or the blah, 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 feeding the people or and his prayer was God bless me today da, 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 and it was all about blessing him and he at first he was like what a selfish prayer I can't believe it blah, blah, blah. and then he realized that that's the crux of it all right there is that until you start first by being blessed you cannot be a blessing to anybody else you have nothing to give until you first have received. And what made me think of this again was I had watched this, you ever watch those extreme weight loss shows that are just way too fucking long? It's two hours long. It's insane. Like it could be 20 minutes of I was really morbidly obese and then I, I signed up for this show and then I resented the guy and then I reneged and then I lost the weight and this is what I look like now. That's all it really needs to be. But it's two fucking hours long of the same story over and over again. And I'm riveted. <laughs> so... <laughs> but it's a big chunk out of time when I could be thinking about lunch. <laughs> so I was watching the show with this nurse on and they all have to be in a position where they need to lose like 150 pounds or so and it's, it is really about they're diabetic and they're this and they're that. So this nurse and all the nurses on her floor ended up also doing it. They weren't doing the show, but they were part of the show in that they decided to do it with her. And what I didn't know, and the statistic they were saying, was that 55% of nurses are obese. Now, this goes back to the whole beginning again when I told you the lie, when you know better, you do better. If there's anybody who knows better, it's nurses. Nurses who are actually in the hospital with heart patients, with people with diabetes, with all of these things, know better and are getting more obese and more obese. And to me, it is for one reason and one reason only, because of their complete focus on others. The complete and total focus on taking care of other people and making yourself not a priority at all. And in fact, that's the story that Marie Osmond, you know, who lost her weight on Nutrisystem and Dancing with the Stars and all that, talks about how her mother, on her deathbed, her mother's dying words to her were, don't do what I did, because her mother had nine or 10 or 11 kids. Marie has like eight kids. And her mother said, don't do what I did, which was to put everyone else first and ignore yourself, because now I'm not gonna be here for my grandchildren. And because her mother, <coughs> Uh, had never taken care of her health, had always been overweight and had health issues and had heart issues, and she had several strokes. Now, while her mother was in the hospital, that's when Marie gained the weight because she was going to the hospital all the time taking care of her mother and her father, who was also sick at the time, and she said, that's when I gained 50 pounds. And when I was that 50 pounds overweight, on my mother's deathbed, she said, you're doing what I did, stop. So that is the prayer of Jabez, that you start with me. I will have nothing to give if I am not first receiving my own daily bread. So that's why, that's why um, Abraham always says, you say we teach selfishness, we do teach selfishness, because if you don't care enough to care about how you feel, you don't have anything to give anybody else. And that's why their motto is, nothing is more important than that I feel good. And they'll say, oh, that sounds selfish. It is selfish. If you don't make yourself feel good, you will not be able to make anyone else feel good. And this is what I've started to teach people. Again, also, this was a situation that came up with somebody that I was doing a session with where they were saying that they had a lot of anxiety and just sort of free-floating anxiety and worry about things. And I said, well, what do you do when that happens? Like, what, what happened when you're in that state and you're worrying and all this stuff? Well, she, and she said, and she's been in this stuff a long time. And she said, well, I just get so mad because I go, I've read all these books and I know all this stuff. And I listen to Jacob all the time. And I watch Marianne's live streams. And I listen to Beverly Hutchinson and all this stuff. And I don't mind. And I said, yeah, that's not helpful. <laughs> and she is in, again, like a lot of people, she's in an industry where she's helping people. 
So people are coming to her with physical pressure. She's like, you know, in an industry where people are coming in who are hurt and need various kinds of healing and therapy and stuff. And I said, you know, if someone comes into your office and they're hurt, do you say, well, how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> but that's what you're saying to yourself. <laughs> you know, you're saying to yourself, I can't believe I did this again. I can't believe it. I said, why don't you do an intake sheet on yourself? Right? And then talk to yourself the way you would a patient who came into the office. And I said, this again, here's my insanity. I do this with myself all the time. Because I have had such a history of extreme anxiety, I learned to step outside of myself when that happens. And I go, oh, Jacob, girlfriend, you're a mess. You're not going to be doing anything today. I'm going to be doing everything. I'm going to take care. And you treat yourself like another person. And you go, I'm going, because you have those skills. I said to this woman, you're a business professional, and you're very good at what you do, but you're not doing it for yourself. You know that old, the cobbler's children have no shoes. <laughs> right? So you're not, so there's a line, so I reminded her, there's a line in the Course in Miracles that says, if anyone has ever responded to you with joy, it means that you are capable of activating joy, why are you not using that on yourself? Do you get that? The irresponsibility of not making yourself happy and not taking care of yourself? Of, I have the talent, but I don't use it on myself because we're taught that's wrong. And we're taught that if we take care of others, someone will take care of us, and we know it's a fucking lie. We know it's a lie. It's one of those things we call hope. Oh, hope. Hope someone will be there for me. They won't. <laughs> you know why? The platinum rule. The platinum principle is this. Do unto yourself as you would have others do unto you because they will. Whatever you do to yourself, the world will reflect back to you. If you ignore yourself, others will ignore you because the universe can only mirror you back to you. If you ignore yourself, the world will ignore you. If you treat yourself well, the world will begin to treat you well. Listen, again, let's turn to our friend Donald Trump. Where do you think he is on his list of priorities? Right? In terms of deservability, of like, you know, like when you think about the good works that he has done, all the positive difference that he has made into the lives of others. <laughs> you look at that and you go, and still, every night, he sleeps peacefully next to a model <laughs> and trades them up occasionally once they get that first couple of wrinkles. Time to upgrade to that you've aged out of the system, right? Because the world treats you the way you treat yourself. So when you, so now, obviously I'm not saying, but I don't have to. I don't have to say in a room like this that you should never help anybody. That's not the problem. In rooms like this, that's not the problem. People act like that's the problem in rooms like this. That is not the problem in rooms like this. In rooms like this, I don't have to tell you, you know, you should help other people and you should think of others and you should this and you should that. Because in rooms like this, nine times out of 10, the majority of people in the room are exhausted from focusing on other people. The, this is why I always say I'm a teacher of teachers because the vast majority of people who are coming to me are people who are involved in helping other people. They are people who are therapists, who are massage therapists, who are social workers, who are psychiatrists, who are all kinds of things where they're already doing that. I don't have to sit here and say, stop thinking about yourself all the time. That is usually not the problem in these rooms. The problem in these rooms is usually thinking, if I just save everyone, then I'll finally sleep peacefully at night. If I can, if I can fix everyone in my family, if I can make, if I can just bring, and it's like, hmm, not so much. In fact, that's why you don't sleep peacefully at night. It's because you're trying to control other people in situations and not controlling the one thing you can control, which is your own mind and thinking. It brings us back to right where we started. We're taught everything except the use of our own mind. 
So that's enough for a month. Just chew on that for a fucking month. All right? We're going to do a prayer. Once again, we close our eyes. Take a deep breath. And just think for a moment about something that you can do for yourself in the coming week, in the coming day even, something that you can do to really take care of yourself, to nurture yourself, to love yourself, to bring yourself joy, or whatever it is that would feed your soul. And now also look to see how open are you to receive, to receive far beyond what you've earned, what you've worked for, something that goes beyond explanation, that is simply, I have asked and it was given. Are you willing to let go of any thought that you might have that life needs to be hard, that in order to have more, you need to work and struggle more? Are you willing to say first, bless me huge, expand my boundaries and enlarge my territory and make joyful use of me, not miserable use of me today, not sacrificial use of me today. God, make joyful use of me today that through this use, we'll all be enlivened and prospered, that it's a win-win, that it's never a win-lose. It's always a win-win. That I'm willing now to open, to receive, enough to share and to spare, that it is not just enough to get by consciousness, it is a more than enough consciousness of whatever it is, of love, of time, of energy, of peace. And look now to see if you are willing to really move into your garden now and begin to bear great spiritual fruit by just this daily practice of minding your mind to really cultivate love and peace, and joy, and patience, and self-control, and kindness, beginning first with yourself. To acknowledge yourself for the wonderful being that you already are. To know that it is entirely possible to enjoy this journey through life every day. That in fact, it's possible for us to learn our deepest spiritual lessons through joy. So we offer ourselves now to this joyous transformative process of changing our paradigms where they need to be changed and increasing the ones that are already serving us so well. We offer ourselves now our hands and our feet and our voices to be guided and used to be the lighthouses that we are so lit up from within that all darkness is illuminated for ourselves and for anyone who cares to join in the light. We give thanks for having been brought together this morning by this power and this presence, letting this infinite love move through us to the world around us. We are so thankful. And together we all say, amen. You might want to stretch a little bit. I'm not finished. I thought I was. I so thought I was. I so thought I was. But I had one more thing to say. This is great. This is fun. This is a fun one, especially any of those of you who exercise. I, 
I've been listening to this for years and years and years, and I ne and it never occurred to me to say it to people because I was not yet torturing people about speaking things out loud and stuff. But somebody years ago gave me this CD by this guy who does these affirmations that are to exercise by. So it's music, and it's like to motivate you, and he's saying, and it's funny because he has a weird little accent anyhow, but, and the first time I heard it was like, that doesn't make any sense, it's so weird, but I loved it. And it was, uh, one of them was, the more I work out, the more money I make. And he was just saying that, the more I work out, and he says it in this weird accent, the more I work out, the more money I make. And the other one was, um, uh, there was two of them, the, and the more joy I feel, the stronger my muscles get. And I thought, and both of them, I was like, that doesn't make any fucking sense at all, and I love it. Like, it doesn't make any sense that the more, the first, the this is what, it, now it says, because he has two versions, the newer one that I have now is, which even that one's 10 years old, is the more I work out, the more money I make. But the first version was the more cardio I do, the more money I make. And I was doing cardio when I did it, and I was like, I love that. The more cardio I do, the more money I make. It doesn't make any sense at all. But here's the thing. This is the brilliance about how this works and why it works, is that, the subconscious mind, which is creates everything, doesn't care if anything makes any sense. It just does it. Because most of the things that torment you don't make any sense at all. Your fears don't usually make any sense. They're, it's like just crazy fears of like the zombie attack. Like just weird, like stupid things that you fear. But your subconscious mind doesn't know. It just follows orders of be in survival mode. Right? You, there are people who have you know, $30,000 in the bank, but they're living in survival mode, so their subconscious mind is activated of live in survival mode, be worried, be stressed out, keep your guard up, cover your ass. That's why you don't sleep at night, because your subconscious mind doesn't go, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, we have $30,000. Your subconscious mind just listens. So when you say to your subconscious mind, the more cardio we do, the more money we make, your subconscious mind goes, yeah, the more cardio we do, the more money we make. And then you're like, oh my God, I found a $50 bill. And I, and I was just, when I got back from my run today, there were 10 checks in the mail. And I was like, all this stuff. Because your subconscious mind doesn't go, you're fucking crazy. It goes, move on that. <laughs> right? So the reason I mention that is that would be a great thing for you to play around with in anything. So know that it doesn't have to make sense, but if you can make it fun for you, it can be like, the more I clean the kitty litter, the more sex I have. Like, it doesn't make any sense, right? But you can use it in things that ordinarily might be not that joyful to you, where you can bring joy to it of like, you know, the more I clean up vomit at work, the more money I make. It doesn't, like, it doesn't have to make sense. It's just some way to shift your consciousness and your awareness into a non-resistant mode where you're not in resistance to what you're doing. That helps take you out of that idea of I have my bondage time and then I have my free time. Make sense? Okay, hurry before I get another idea. Get out. <laughs> Just get out. <laughs> if I have another thought, it's 